Good morning. Welcome back to Jack's Coffee Break and happy belated Mother's Day to my mom. Uh, so today we are going to finally be dealing with the llama and the alpaca here on the channel. The llama has been around since the South America pack, but the alpaca just recently got added with a barnyard pack, and I'm very excited. They're they're one of the animals where like I'm not necessarily excited about them for my own like things and projects and stuff like that, but I am very excited because they are my mom's favorite animal. Them and the llamas. She loves them. So today, as an ode to her, I am going to spend entirely too long talking about llamas and alpacas and and civilization and how South American civilization could not exist without these animals. Um, in order to understand anything that is going on from like anywhere in the Andes mountains, you have to understand these animals. It Nothing functions without them. Um, so, of course, here in the United States, we have been importing llamas and alpacas for a, f a couple of decades now. Um, they got really popular back in the early 2000s. Their, popula their, their popularity has declined fairly steeply uh, over the last 20 years or so. Um, both interest and populations, they're, they're just not faring very well here in North America, mostly due to a lack of interest by farmers. Um, but the main reasons why you would import them to the United States at all is primarily for their wool production. They are wool creatures. They are not leather creatures, they're wool creatures. They're like sheep. Um, in order to get material from an alpaca, you shave it. Um, there is no harm done to the animal, and this actually is really, really good for sustainability farming, which we will talk about, because that is the crux of the thing. So. Let's let's start with a little bit of biological history, and then we will go into anthropology, and that will bring us back to the modern day. So, llamas and alpacas are both descendants of camelids, um, or essentially they are camelids. This this means that yes, they are shockingly related to the dromedary and the Bactrian camels over in the Middle East and in North Africa. So how did we get here? <laughs> how do we have populations on two completely opposite sides of the world, two completely unrelated climates and ecosystems? Well, it turns out that the origin of camels actually starts in a place you probably wouldn't expect. They start in North America, of all places. So originally, and we're talking like back in like the, the Pleistocene era, I think it was probably I think it was the late Pleistocene, but my, my sources may clarify otherwise. And by the way, sources for all of this are going to be linked down in the description if you would like to learn more. So early to late Pleistocene, we have the first camels beginning to evolve in North America. They are not really the camels that you imagine from Asia and Africa, but they're also not going to be the llamas and alpacas that, that you would expect out of South America. They're somewhere in the middle. And they're specifically developing in sort of the area around Canada, Yukon, um, way up in the north. And this is still during a period where like it's it's very cold forests, um, but they're they're migrating up and forth and around the Arctic Circle and then back down into North America. They're they're in this whole range through here. And so as they continue to migrate and evolve, uh, we, we see them sort of begin to split into the different camelid species that we're eventually going to get. So the Yukon camel, which is our, our earliest known, as far as my research has been able to find, ancestor of camelids that we have like fossils for. So they were originally developed um, up in the in the Arctic Circle, and many of the adaptations that they evolved into as they migrated through this area and eventually across the Bering Strait down into Asia and then further down into Africa. They essentially went the opposite direction humans went, is the long story. Um, but as they made this migration across uh, the Arctic and then Siberia, the, many of the adaptations that they would develop for this um, would eventually be what contributes to them being such amazing desert animals. So, for example, the large fat stores that we normally associate with dromedary camels and uh, Bactrian camels, those were for those areas where they could find a lot of water, but they couldn't find a lot of food. And so they developed these massive fat stores so that way as they migrated across these areas, they would be able to hold on to those reserves until they get to the next forest, the next green patch, make it through the winter, whatever. 
um, the eye adaptations that we see in most of our old world camos are also developing during this time. Um, so most camels have basically a, a see-through eyelid and this is to help in case, you know, for modern day during, you know, desert you know, sandstorms and through blinding heat and then, you know, all these different experiences in the desert, um, those eyelids help to let them see through and keep an eye on whatever, don't mind the thunder, whatever is going on around them. Um, the eyelashes are there to keep the sand, you know, out from their eyes. and So there's all these kinds of eye protection things. Well, these were also extremely good adaptations for the snow because you have roughly the same issues. You have, you know, problems of snow blindness, snowstorms that are potentially going to get debris in your eye. Um, the the feet the hooves of camels are designed to spread wide um and once again snow and sand have very much the same properties when it comes to traversal if you're not careful you are going to sink you want to disperse as much weight as possible so that way you stay above the surface and so there's all of these adaptations that are cropping up and as the the yukon camels um eventually migrate across the bering strait down into asia africa all of these different adaptations begin to refine into the camels that we see today but another group split off and this is the group that we're going to be focusing on today these would migrate down into south america and eventually become the Guanaco and the Vicuña. These are sort of the the ancestral state of llamas and alpacas. They both exist today. You can go find them. You can go see them. Um, but the the Guanacos and the alpacas never developed these same adaptations that we expect to see from other camelids. So they don't have the giant fat stores. They don't quite have the same like eye protection structures. They don't really have the same kind of hooves. Um, what they do have is is thick wool fur. Um, and it's not initially wool. Like when you see a guanaco, when you see a vicuña, they're not like woolly. They're not like a sheep, you know. Um, but eventually, as they continue to evolve um, in the different regions of South America where they're found, this is primarily going to be in the Andes Mountains, um, and then slightly down into Patagonia, you start to get into that region. Patagonia being a essentially a cold desert, um, the Andes Mountains also being very cold, very bitter, not a lot of greenery, not a lot of foliage, but enough that they can survive at the sizes that they were living at. And so we, we see a different set of adaptations develop. You know, you have the, the very long Long ears, um, you have the dense fur, and so all of these things are helping them to survive in this new climate of the Andes Mountains. So, this sort of natural evolution is going to continue until the introduction of humans. This continues until about 35,000 BC, when the first human civilizations pop up in Peru. I'm not kidding, that is how old they are. They are contemporaneous with the Mesopotamians and the Egyptians. So this, this civilization that develops, um, they're on the coast of Peru, and they're called either the Coral Supe civilization or the Nordichico. Or the Nordichico. Um, and I'm going to call them the Nordichico because it's easier for me to say. So the Nordichico are considered one of the six cradles of civilization, uh, like I said established generally accepted around 35,000 BC and they're on the coast of Peru sort of in central Peru uh, as it stands right now on on the coast and most of their civilization that's developing we only have sparse remnants of it and it tells us a lot of weird and interesting things about them so number one they had to develop on the coast and on the rivers of which there's like three to seven rivers depending on where you're calculating their civilization at um and then, of course, on the coastline. So this means that as we find more remnants of them, most of what we find in their diet is going to be vegetation and fish. Lots and lots of fish, mussels, shells, all of these sorts of things. They're not eating off the land. They're eating off the sea. And this is the crux of the thing, because South America does not actually have a lot of good farmable animals. It's not like Europe and Asia, where there's lots of creatures that are pretty well suited to being 
adapted to human civilization. That's just not the case in South America. You know, we all think of the jaguar, but um, beyond them, there's lots of cats, there's lots of coyotes. Um, most of the herbivores that exist in this area, because of, you know, they're, they're mostly migrating up from Patagonia, and some of them are existing in the nearly impenetrable Amazon rainforest. What you're getting is a lot of small herbivorous mammals that are not necessarily able to be bred up into you know, something more useful. Um, in fact, the largest thing that you're, you're going to find outside of, you know, your llamas and alpacas that is qualified to be eaten as meat is the guinea pig. And if you're far enough up, which Peru is not, um, you might be able to get like capybara, you know, and capybara is eaten today as a food source. It's actually, um, for the purposes of the Catholic Church, it's considered a fish. Um, that's all, <laughs> fun facts. Um, <laughs> But yeah, so most of what you're looking at in terms of food in this area is going to be vegetation, it's going to be fish if you're down on the coastline, and this is not going to work the moment that you get up into the mountains. Um, you might ask why move up into the Andes Mountains in the first place, and there's a lot of reasons. Number one, neighbors. When you don't have a lot of good meat-based food supplies to go around, you end up with people like the Aztecs. Why did they do what they do? It's because meat was scarce and humans were plentiful. Um, and that's all I'm going to say because, uh, hmm, I don't, I don't want my channel to get deleted. Um, so because of this lack of resources, essentially what the Norte Chico ended up doing is they, they found the guanacos and the vicuñas and ended up breeding them over successive generations until eventually we, we get the modern alpaca and llama. It, they're literally direct descendants. They are, in derived from, you know, this original stock. And the original stock actually still exists. We still have guanacos, we still have vicuñas. You can find them in zoos, but they're extremely rare and they're heavily protected by the Peruvian government. They're not really open for export unless you can like really prove your situation. Shockingly, it's a little bit like pandas in China, um, but with less politics, I will say. A lot less like world stage stuff. Um, but very much so that same level of like protectiveness over this like cornerstone of their civilization from the beginning of humans in South America till today. So critical, absolutely critical. As they were sort of developed, um, as, as these different South American groups uh, worked with the alpacas and the vicuñas to evolve them to the point that we have today, um, the primary things that they were focusing on were wool production for textiles and meat production. Um, not so much leather, not so much leather. They mostly used cloth-based textiles. And this is where we need to go back to the Nordic Chico um, and eventually yeah, their, their various groups that would succeed them into a group that you probably know of called the Inca. Um, if you paid attention in high school, you were probably told about the Inca. These are the people who you're thinking of in, in like, all along the Andes Mountains. Um, if you know of Machu Picchu, which you should, the map exists right here in Planet Zoo, um, the Inca are the ones who built Machu Picchu and, and you know, various locations like that. So as these different groups are going, they're evolving the llamas and the alpacas mostly for their wool production. And the reason why we see this is because of the sustainability that we started to talk about earlier. So Again, the Andes Mountains um, are, are really difficult to traverse. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. Um, but because of their difficulty in traversal, uh, it means that civilizations are going to be kind of limited in the ways that they can grow. So what are they focusing on? And, you know, what are they growing? What are they developing? What are their, their artistic aspirations? All of those kinds of things. All of those things are going to be uh, not necessarily determined by the environment, but rather um, shaped and, and limited by the environment. So llamas and alpacas especially become very critical to their infrastructure simply because this is what's going to provide, you know, most of, of your textiles. And, you know, I've, I've heard rumors that in some cases, uh, wool was woven into like currency, um, or other kinds of, of means of communication. That's another big one. They're also going to be critical for moving, you know, transporting materials up and down the mountains. And, 
in they're not really eating them i will say um most of the time most most of what they're eating is going to be fruits and vegetables so it's going to be mostly maize which is corn for us americans um it's going to be uh, I, don't, I don't think they, I'm, I'm not sure about avocados. I'm not sure those are, are regional or if they were trading for those. Um, there is going to be a lot of trade that's involved. Uh, there's going to be potatoes. So there's there's going to be a lot of vegetable food staples. There's not a lot of meat. Um, sort of like I was mentioning earlier, that's going to be limited to things like guinea pigs. So, but you, in order to maintain a civilization of the size that we will eventually see with the Inca, you need to have those trade networks. You need to be able to have areas where you have large food productions, um, and then you need to be able to take all of that food and transport it. So llamas are going to be very useful for that. On top of that, because of the fact that you don't really need to kill llamas in order to get the most out of them, you know, that's going to be a huge thing. So definitely llama wool, llama fur. Um, and if a llama died, and generally it was only acceptable if the if the animal died of natural causes, mostly out of, of spiritual reasons, but then the leather would be used. So that's where you're going to get your leather goods from is going to be, you know, if the animal dies to predators or, or you know, old age or disease or whatever. Um, and so all of these things are contributing to how the civilization shapes, uh, shapes out. And, and this kind of, again, why is the llama so important for their transportation? It's because they also didn't have a wheel. And this sounds ludicrous when you look at it on paper because the wheel is like the simplest thing in order to make. But consider, if you are an Incan living in the Andes Mountains, um, if you're familiar with the Alps, imagine a wheel in the Alps. Okay? Yeah. No. No. Same with the Andes, which are even more jacked. They... it doesn't work. There's no point in having a wheel or you're building a death machine. <laughs> In order for these civilizations to survive at all, as mentioned, you have to have the llama and you have to have the vicuña because they're gonna be your best source of meat, they're gonna be your best source of textiles, they're your best source of transportation. You can't ride a llama or an alpaca. They're just far too small, they're far too delicate. They're not like camels um, that we think of in, in you know, the Middle East. They, they're not that sturdy, but what they can do is they can haul materials. Um, and they can basically pack animals. They're more like donkeys. Um, so this is going to be another part of what is going to make the civilization function. Um, and most things are operating under manpower. So, you know, if you need to get a message, you know, from point A to point B, there's nobody riding a horse. There is a dude running down the mountain <laughs> and then back up the mountain. Um, and so, you know, the llamas are, are going to be a pretty key for making sure that you have resources along the way, that, you know, you have way stops in order to support any kind of communication. Um, all kinds of stuff that goes into these animals. So, and this is a very brief glimpse. This is just an overview. Um, but if you want to learn more, I, I really suggest you do because they're fascinating animals and their history is absolutely insane. Like I said, you, you need to understand the alpaca and the llama in order to understand South American civilization in the same way that you need to understand the horse in order to understand Europe or Africa or Asia. Um, it's it's just it, it's a big deal um so anyway let's go ahead and talk about this build a little bit and I, i'm pretty sure that i'm running out of time at this point so this will be nice and brief the main things that i'm looking for in developing this build are areas where it makes sense to integrate these animals and then um you know sort of building out the area so that way we get this kind of lived in feel to the valley so this whole area right here took me a very long time i ended up moving my setup so if my audio sounds a little bit different um it's because a i got a fan on because i have a fan in this room um and b i get to lounge so anyway I, I moved, um, so things are going to sound a little bit weird, but unfortunately the downside to this is that it means that my mouse and my keyboard are no longer set up the same way. Um, so it was very slow going trying to get even this little bit developed. Um, there's a lot more that I would have liked to do with it, but I'm pretty happy with where it is right now. Um, establish some of the trees and the flowers and things like that that we're going to be blending into the rest of this sort of valley um, down onto the road and the next thing that I wanted to do was interconnect the road so that way we no longer have to have these little weird like pocket stations we can actually have something that is more akin to like a zoo setup eventually um, so those were the main things that I wanted to focus on 
So, anyway, thank you for joining me. Um, I hope that this has been even remotely sensible. I will try and link as many resources in the description as I can for you. Um, it just, you know, fair warning, I may be out of date on some things. I may have gotten some things wrong in here. You know, the, stip the typical warnings. You're listening to a random person you don't know on the internet. I'm going to get things wrong. Don't take what I say verb verbatim. But anyway, thank you for joining me. Happy belated Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Um, if you are not a mom, but you have a mom, please go hug her. Uh, yeah, so anyway, talk to you guys soon. Good luck. Uh, have... Yeah, good uh, good luck, have fun and a uh, happy building. <laughs>